Yeah. Well, welcome. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Phil Hayden from Tufts University, who's here as our pioneer in biomedical sciences speaker. And rather than going through his long, laborious, and productive uh, career in science, I want to explain to you why Phil is truly a pioneer in biomedical sciences in our field. So what makes a pioneer a pioneer? I think it's very simple. If textbooks are changed because of what you've done, if there's a chapter in there describing what you have contributed to the field that we hadn't known before, then, then you're a pioneer in biomedical sciences. And that's exactly what Phil has done. Most of the students here know that we talk about the tripartite synapse. There was a time, and actually Phil contributed very much to the, the, the regular synapse, synaptic development, calcium signaling, growth cone guidance, whatnot, where a synapse was a pre- and a post-synaptic neuron. And then there came a time when we now talk about it as there's an astrocyte that takes part in that synapse. Well, it was Phil's work in uh, beginning in the 90s that actually showed that the astrocyte is there not just to listen, but to actually release uh, neurotransmitters and modulate the synapse function. In 1994, he termed the, uh, reproduced that term uh, tripartite synapse, and he also showed in his subsequent work that there's a number of gliotransmitters that are being released, so we now talk about gliotransmission. Now, showing that uh, neurotransmitters are being released is one thing, but showing how they're being released, that there is a vesicular machinery, but the important part was, is it important? To study whether it's important, you have to go in vivo and show that behavior of an animal has changed as a result of that signaling. That's not an easy task. So what Phil did is uh, he created the dominant negative cell type specific snare with which he could eliminate selectively the release of, of neurotransmitters from astrocytes and show that they change behavior. And one of the discoveries he made in so doing was a very complex behavior was changed in the sleep, sleep drive. He was able to show that that was due to a change in the release of adenosine from astrocytes, that they are actually a release of ATP from astrocytes, which is extracellularly hydrolyzed to adenosine, working through A1 adenosine receptors, modulating sleep drive in animals. Later, he showed that adenosine is also involved in pain processing and in uh, inhibiting uh, pain in the spinal cord, and again, that astrocytes are involved with that. So very complex behaviors regulated, you know, by astrocytes. Really amazing findings. So rather than telling you about all the other things he's done, I just want to bring home to you that the chapters that we're reading about, uh, tripartite synapse, uh, gliotransmission, all the way to astrocytes and behavior, Phil really single-handedly deserves the credit uh, for doing that. He's been a fantastic colleague. He's been a great ambassador for the field of glial biology. He's won numerous awards. Uh, the Sloan Award, uh, he, he, he won the Javits Award from NINDS. Um, he trained a number of people. They're all successful scientists in their own right. So it is really a pleasure to have Phil here and talk to us about his seminal work on sleep and glia. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Well, Harry, thank you. That was very kind. <laughs> I'm not certain how to follow that. So what I thought I would uh, do today is tell you about glia, the last centuries of work. Yeah, that's a staggering number. Uh, hopefully it won't take a century, and I'll just take some pockets. But what I also want to do is identify some of the key points in the work that we and others have done to try and give you some of the history. And I'll tell some stories about how peculiar things actually led to the discoveries, as opposed to the reality that you read in, you know, in the papers. So first, conflicts of interest. I have a couple of companies. Uh, disclosure done. So, late 1800s. Cahal, what insight this individual had. He was able to look at uh, brain tissue, make beautiful drawings, and have insight. Now here, this is one of his best drawings because he puts a glial cell right in the middle of the picture. This is the astrocyte contacting the vasculature and then contacting numerous neurons. And 
this is translated from this article in the late 1800s. Alfonso Araque, a former student, uh, postdoc of mine, he translated it. And he speculated the astrocytic processes regulate sleep and wake. And he speculated that by the astrocytic process invading the synapse, that this would act like an insulator, would promote sleep, and then during wakefulness it would retract. And what amazing insight. I, what nobody else knows is seven years later, he published another paper where he said, eh, Forget all that. That's <laughs> so he was wrong once. <laughs> but uh, this is where it really the idea of an astrocyte having an influence on a synapse was first born. Now, I, as Harry said, I studied synapses. And I was trying to understand how synapses worked. And then one day we we're having our first confocal microscope delivered. And you know, when I, back in you know, the Stone Age, when you had a confocal microscope delivered, it didn't work. Uh, and so you'd be sitting and you desperately wanted to do an experiment, and Science Magazine came. It came at that day and age as a magazine. And on the cover was a beautiful picture, and inside that article was from Stephen Smith. And this captured my imagination. And what Stephen's group did, they made dissociated cultures of astrocytes. And you know, you record from an astrocyte, they're boring. Negative 80 millivolts. Um, but they used the calcium indicators developed by Roger Chen and showed that when you applied the glutam glutamate, the neurotransmitter, you got oscillations in intracellular calcium. Well, what do those oscillations do? And this really was in my head, and through a little bit of luck, I started collaborating with somebody who doesn't get credit, so I'm going to give him the credit now, Sergio Yeftinia, who's in the veterinary school. And he studied pain, and he'd take dorsal root ganglia explants, let the axons grow, then you superfuse an HPLC, a measure glutamate release from the axons. So he was interested in pain, so he'd add things like capsaicin, bradykinin, and measure glutamate release. So I said, Sergio, you think it's from the axons? How do you know? He said, well, of course it's the axons. So I said, well, kill the neurons and prove it to me. So we killed the neurons. We had an empty culture dish that released glutamate. Oh! So we looked in the culture dish, and there were cells. Well, they happened to be glial cells. So this, then we said, oh! We now went, but Stevens article, calcium in the astrocyte, let's make astrocyte cultures, which then led uh, to the idea that astrocytes could release chemical transmitters. So we did the same thing, purified astrocyte culture. People say, why do you use bradykinin? Well, it was historical from the pain work that the surgery did. And this causes the release of glutamate into the superfusate. And this is calcium is both necessary and sufficient for this effect. So if you use an ionophore, with calcium in the external bathing solution, you get increased glutamate release, but if you remove calcium, you don't. In that study, um, we also co-cultured with neurons and showed that this glutamate release was able to act on NMDA receptors and excite neurons. Now, at this time, several people really became interested in astrocytes. Oh, and by the way, I had not yet submitted a grant. I didn't even bother submitting a grant because it would never have been discussed. Uh, so I waited four to five years before submitting my first grant on astrocytes. Now, Eric Newman, for example, and other labs had started studying the astrocyte. And I wrote to Trends in Neuroscience and said, you know, it's time to have a review article. So we started writing a review article. And in the lab, we had a little lunchroom. And I said, you know, what we write is irrelevant. No one's going to read it anyway. But let's have a good title. And so for two months, we had provisional titles on the board. And then one day, we said, well, really, what we're trying to express here is there's three elements to a synapse. And that's how we came up with the concept of the tripartite synapse, where an astrocyte is associated with the pre- and postsynaptic terminal. And that astrocyte does many things. It takes up extracellular potassium, hence the low input resistance of the astrocyte. Glutamate transporters clear glutamate. But also, there are receptors expressed by the astrocyte, and this goes back to Stevens' work showing the calcium oscillations. And so we then became really interested in, does a neuron talk to an astrocyte and the astrocyte talk back? So this was, uh, so we titled the article, The Tripartite Synapse, Glear the Unacknowledged Partner. So we were doing all of our work in cell culture, and it's very challenging to do cell-specific manipulations. So at this point, we started working with uh, Ken McCarthy to see if we could develop a molecular genetic strategy so we could do cell-specific manipulations and ask, what's the consequence on neurons? Well, 
this was actually quite funny because all of our best results have been totally unpredicted. Uh, you go in with a hypothesis, and then the beauty of science is if you listen to the data, the data will instruct you as to what's occurring. Stop trying to force fit your hypothesis to the data. So we are actually looking for effects of a glial manipulation on extracellular glutamate affecting synaptic transmission. We found something totally different. What we did was we made, as Harry said, the dominant negative snare animal, where we conditionally express the snare domain of a synaptic protein to interfere with exocytosis from astrocytes. So here, green, about 60% of the astrocytes are expressed in EGFP plus DN snare. And we found, what we found was really surprising. The magnitude of excitatory synaptic transmission was larger. So we combed the literature, and it's well known for decades. There's a tonic adenosine-mediated presynaptic inhibition. And here's some of the data. This is, we've now normalized the baseline Schaefer collateral field EPSP to 100%. Then we added an A1 receptor antagonist, CPT. And in controlled brain slices, we get a nice 40% facilitation. But in those where the astrocyte expresses the end snare, this is significantly abrogated. We did, in, we did ATP imaging in the brain slices in the extracellular space. And through this, we showed what was happening. The astrocyte is normally releasing ATP. Every cell has ectoenzymes that hydrolyze ATP to adenosine. And then the adenosine is causing presynaptic inhibition. So that was kind of exciting. Uh, it was a turn up we didn't expect. And then I had, you know, now the other great thing about the lab is you get new people coming in who think differently. So there's a st former student, Michael Lassa, came to the lab and he said, Phil, we've got to study sleep. <laughs> Why? Well, you know, Michelle's got some caffeine there. Caffeine is an antagonist on certain adenosine receptors. He said, this has to be affecting sleep. So we collaborated uh, with Marcus Frank at uh, Penn, who's an expert in sleep, and we tried to figure out whether the astrocyte may influence sleep. Now, the way, this is an animal. It's sleeping. It's not a head, and this has EEG electrodes. Uh, it's not that they're heavy. Its head's not bobbing down. It's asleep. And what we did is we study sleep in four-second epochs for 48 hours. And there's multiple elements to control of sleep. When you cross time, uh, time zones, you get jet lag. That's because you've got a circadian oscillator. Right? And your oscillator takes days to reset. But on top of that, you have the sleep homeostat. Now, if tonight I stay up late, I want to go to sleep. That's my homeostat is regulating adenosine, and that's driving me to sleep. This is why we take caffeine, because it prevents the effects of adenosine. Now, to test for this, what we do on the second day, we do a six-hour week, the royal way. Mike used to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, get into the lab for 6 a.m. when the lights went on in the vivarium. He then sleep deprived mice for six hours, and this probes the sleep homeostat. So let's look at the homeostatic response. So when tonight you go into uh, when you go to sleep, you first go into non-rapid eye movement sleep, non-REM sleep, and you have these slow oscillations, slow wave activity, and the power or the strength of those slow waves is proportional to the drive to sleep. So. Animals have been awake, and let's look at the open symbols. And this is Zeitgeber zero. So Zeitgeber is not real time. It's time in relation to lights on. So Zeitgeber zero is when the lights go on in your vivarium. So initially, the power of slow wave activity is high, and as the animals sleep, the pressure to sleep declines. But when we express the ensnare in the astrocyte, you see there's, much, there's reduced drive to sleep as measured by power of slow wave activity. Now, if this is the homeostat, sleep deprivation will change this. So the next day, Mike got up early, he did his sleep deprivation, and now you see the power to sleep as measured by slow wave activity is dramatically enhanced. And as the animal sleeps, it dissipates. And you express the ensnare in the astrocyte. This really reduces this uh, change in slow wave activity. I look at EEGs, and they look like squiggles. And this was how it was at this time in my life. I didn't really believe this until we did the next component of the experiment. If you stay up late tonight, you need an alarm clock to get up on time to go.
go to work because you have a compensatory increase in sleep time. So maybe these animals will have this compensation impacted. So this is a, um, the two days baseline, and it's the total sleep time. And if they've had a sleep deprivation, you get an increase in sleep time. But when you express DNSNR in the astrocyte, you sleep deprive, and they don't have a compensatory increase in sleep time. They're like a party animal. They can stay up late, they can have fun, get up on time the next morning, go to work. Uh, uh, what I'm not showing you, but I'll just tell you because it's published, this is all mediated by adenosine. We can phenocopy the animal by um, using an A1 receptor antagonist in vivo. We can also phenocopy by doing conditional neuron-specific knockout of the A1 receptor, and we get the same results. So the astrocyte, in some way, is detecting wakefulness. And then it's driving the uh, animal to sleep through this extracellular adenosine. So then Thomas uh, Papwin came to the lab, came from Stefan Olier's lab. He now has his own position at WashU. And Jackie Dunphy and Michaela Tolman were graduate students in the lab. And he said, Phil, astrocytes release deserine. Maybe there is some wakefulness dependent effect there. And so I, in my usual way, I said, prove it. <laughs> so NMDA receptor is one of the most complex ionotropic receptor there is. It doesn't matter how much glutamate is released onto this uh, receptor. It will not gate unless a coagonist is present on the NR1 subunit. And the synaptic coagonist is deserine. This is also called, the, you have heard of the glycine binding site. And so he said, there may well be wakefulness-dependent changes in deserine. And I'm going to show you there are. But in doing this, I want to ask, how is the astrocyte detecting the animals are awake? So Tamar is an amazing scientist. And he's a fun person to have in the lab. He works his uh, behind off. But he's precise. And what he was able to do, he'd get to the vivarium. He could take an animal from the cage, and within three minutes, the brain would be out of the animal. And he really had this time being done very well. And when you do it very quickly, you can maintain some state of the brain of the animal from the vigilant state it was in vivo. So he cuts out brain slices. Then he isolates NMDA field EPSPs by blocking AMPA receptors, reduces magnesium, stimulates the Schaefer collateral. Then to test the saturation of the coagonist site, what you do is you just add on lots of exogenous deserine and see if it facilitates the NMDA field EPSP. So here's simulated data. You add deserine, there was no change. That means all of the coagonist site was already saturated. But if you add deserine and the NMDA field EPSP facilitates, that says the coagonist site was not saturated by endogenous deserine. Now, all of the changes I'm going to show you are specific for the NMDA field EPSP, deserine related, and they're not effects related to the AMPA component. And I won't show you the data, but we're now identifying that the regulation of deserine and, acetyl, uh, and a de ATP adenosine from the astrocyte totally differentially controlled. So now what he does does the experiment that everyone knows the result already. You know if you cut out a brain slice and look at the NMDA field PSP, if you add deserine, you enhance the magnitude of the field EPSP. We know that. It's been known for ages. But everyone takes a brain slice out in the light phase when animals are normally sleeping. Now, I like to say at this point, we do studies of learning and memory at the equivalent of our 3 a.m. If you get me up at 3 a.m. and do a learning and memory task, it's not going to be ideal. So just remember, if you're doing all your studies in the light phase, this not, may not represent what's happening in the active period of mice that are nocturnal. Because if you cut out the brain slice in the dark phase, when the animals are active, the results are very, very different. Now you add exogenous deserine. You don't enhance the NDA field because it's already saturated. So of course, Tama showed me these results, and I said, well, now you've got to record it other times, and you've got to do sleep deprivation to see if it's homeostatic. 
So I took a vacation on a sailboat. I said, I'll see you in a month. <laughs> PI's prerogative. So when I came back, this is essentially the data he'd obtained. So Zeit Geber zero at the end of the active phase, if you add D serum, there's no facilitation of the NMDA field EPSP. But as soon as one hour into the light phase, when the animals have been sleeping, you now see a change. So that um, during this light phase as they're sleeping, you end up with um, subsaturation of the coagulant site. But is this time of day dependent, or is it wakefulness dependent? So what we would do to test for wakefulness, we'd now take the animal at Zeit Geber Zero, just put it into a clean cage, and the animal explores the cage and don't go to sleep. And then you cut the brain slice after two hours of wakefulness, and it's maintained the endogenous saturation of that coagulant site. So this is wakefulness dependent, not just time of day. <coughs> So this is with synaptic NMDA receptor assays in brain slices. We've also used deserine biosensors where we measure extracellular deserine, and we've done in vivo microdialysis, and all the results of all three approaches are internally consistent. And the conclusion is wakefulness provo pr promotes enhanced extracellular deserine to increase NMDA receptor function. But where does it come from? Well, because I'm speaking, we use this astrocytic DN snare animal to ask whether this would impact the results. So uh, here is EGFP in the hippocampus um, where we're doing these assays and the, the, the DN snare. Let's just look at, now you understand how to read these. At Zeit Geber zero, it's the end of the active phase. If you add um, in control slices D serine, there's no change. But when DN snare is expressed in the astrocyte, you facilitate. So that means endogenously, with DN snare in the astrocyte, you're not getting the saturating amount of uh, D serine. In fact, if you look in the red symbols, it's always subsaturating. Now, to introduce you for later slides, we then convert this to a saturation index. So, so what this means is that at the end of Zeit Geber zero is a one, is 100% saturated by endogenous D serine. But at Zeit Gabber 6, after some sleep, it's 80% saturated. But in red, when DN snare was expressed, it's 80% saturated, regardless of wakefulness. So wakefulness promotes elevated D serine. There are multiple sources of D serine. There's this wakefulness component, but there's also wakefulness independence. And the wakefulness dependent D serine is derived from astrocytes. Now, I was gonna show something for Michelle, but I clearly didn't unhide the slides. We've also done another assay where we express the, synapti the vesicle protein together with a single oxygen ge generator, Minisog. And what we can then do is we can illuminate with blue light and inactivate the protein, and within minutes, we then see this change, just as we see with the prolonged expression of transgen. But where does how is the astrocyte detecting that the animal is awake? We know there are two major signals that are ch in, in the brain when we wake up. Norepinephrine, acetylcholine. So we started to ask whether these signals may be uh, mediating this. And what we like to do in the lab meeting is say, okay, let's place our bets. You know, we have 50 cent bets. I said it's norepinephrine. Uh, of course, somebody else is going to say it's acetylcholine because I said norepinephrine. And then Tamar, as a good scientist, just sat on the fence and let the data speak. Turns out, as usual, I was wrong. Norepinephrine causes amazing calcium signals in astrocytes. But here we're taking a brain slice at Zeit Geber 6 when, it's, when the coagulant site's not saturated. So we have this 80% saturation. If you add a, norepinephrine, no change. Wow. But when you add carbacol, a broad spectrum agonist of acetylcholine receptors, you now have full saturation of the coagonist site. He did a lot of pharmacology. I probably had another vacation at this point, so we let him get on with it. If he used an alpha-7 nicotinic receptor antagonist, it prevents the effect of carbacol. So then he used an alpha-7 nicotinic specific agonist, ARR, and a whole bunch of numbers. 
led to um, potentiation that was attenuated by the alpha-7 nicotinic antagonist. And importantly, neither carbacol nor ARR had this potentiating effect when the DN snare was expressed in the astrocyte, suggesting that there's some component of a nicotinic receptor effect through an astrocyte. That's pharmacology. Is it mimicked by a more physiological stimulus? So we then used optogenetics, where we had channel rhodopsin expressed in cholinergic fibers in the hippocampus. We take an animal's brain slice when the NMDA receptor is not saturated. And here's the average data from 10 brain slices. We confirm we're activating the cholinergic fibers. Now what you see is a nice facilitation of the, the um, NMDA field EPSP. Then, as a control, we add exogenous d serine and you see it has no effect. Now, also notice, we stimulated briefly, but the effects are sustained. There's these states of the astrocytes. You know, I said about remembering, essentially, the vigilant state in vivo. Well, in situ, if you give a stimulus, you get a sustained response. Is this mediated by the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor? So we include the alpha-7 antagonist, MLA, Simulate the cholinergic fibers, no change. Then add exogenous T-serine as a positive control, and it facilitates. So the animals wake up, they detect acetylcholine, the astrocyte releases T-serine. Is it a nicotinic receptor on the astrocyte or the neuron? So we then took flux, I think exon 4, I know, some alpha-7 animals, and we used viruses that we, under synapsin promoter, to express Cree recombinase in neurons or in astrocytes. When you express in neurons, you just get this normal wakefulness-dependent changes in the um, saturation index of the NMDA receptor, saying it's not neuronal nicotinics. And importantly, when we express Cree recombinase in the astrocyte, now what happens is, when we express it um, in the astrocyte when the, with the flux allele, now you don't get the wakefulness-dependent changes. So it's an astrocytic nicotinic receptor is detecting these effects. Now, here's our interpretation, is that during the light phase or the inactive period, cholinergic fiber is or less active leading to reduced activation of the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor, and thus reduced deserine from this wakeful-independent pathway. But as the animals wake, acetylcholine is released, it binds to the nicotinic receptor, causes enhanced deserine and increased NMDA receptor function, which sort of makes sense, because it's during wakefulness when we're having experience-dependent learning is occurring, and so we facilitated the NMDA receptors. And there are some theories about sleep whereby in sleep, you're actually scaling back synapses, and it's uh, different processes are involved. Oh, I got it here. Let me just quickly show you the on-demand method, which is a really fun tool. It's developed by Roger Chen's lab. It uses Minisog. It's a single oxygen generator, 106 amino acids uh, in size. You can make a fusion protein, turn on blue light, and then activate the local protein. So we've, uh, J uh, Jackie has made this with neuronal promoters, astrocytic promoters, and just to jump through, here we express the mini-SOG presynaptically in area CA3, record basal EPSPs, turn on blue light, poof, inactivate synaptic transmission. So now what we can do, both in vivo and in situ, is do acute manipulations of protein function, which overcome many of the concerns about weeks of expression of altered protein. We've uh, done some work now. We express this in the astrocyte, and we ask that 20% wakefulness-dependent component of deserine, is that affected with this? And our early results are showing when we turn on the light, we then see a reduction in about 15% in the um, NMDA receptor potential. I'll leave it there. Every time we get results, we want to think therapeutically. Is there any relevance? Um, and when you think in schizophrenia, some of the risk factors for schizophrenia are mutations in serine race phase, the enzyme that converts L-serine to D-serine. 
D-amino acid oxidase, enzyme that metabolizes D-amino acid. Um, and our one subunit at the NMDA receptor where D-serine binds. Then this peculiar one, 5-HT3 receptor. Well, it turns out an antagonist for 5-HT3 receptor elevates acetylcholine. So is there really therapeutically a link between acetylcholine and D-serine? And uh, in both Cambridge at the time, there was an alpha-7 nicotinic receptor partial agonist that was in clinical trials for cognitive enhancement in Alzheimer's disease and in schizophrenia. Well, does this partial agonist that was in trials work through D-serine? So what Tomad did, he either injected animals, this is at Zeitgeber Zero, so the animal's about to go to sleep, he injects either a vehicle or with EVP6124, this uh, clinical ca um, molecule that enhances um, nicotinic receptor function. No change in wakefulness in the animals. Four hours later, after they've been asleep, he comes and does the slice assay. And notice if it was vehicle, you add D-serine, you still facilitate as expected. But when EVP6124 was on board, now the change in D-serine uh, had occurred. And so as a result of this, a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies had abandoned their work related to D-amino acid oxidase inhibition as a potential for treatment of uh, cognitive dysfunction and schizophrenia. And now there's two, two groups have actually re-energized that work. Okay, good, we got time. So astrocytes are detecting wakefulness at least through acetylcholine when in terms of deserine. Uh, I'll tell you now, the adenosine is not mediated by acetylcholine and we're we have clues as to what that's on. The astrocytes, another one of those bizarre experiments. Uh, I'm going to show you there's lactate provided by the astrocyte actually can promote wakefulness. So whilst they can have one effect to promote stimulation of sleep homeostat, early in the dark phase, they promote wakefulness. Now, I have to give a little credit of this study to Mike and Nedegaard. Now, you, any of you know me and Mike, and you know Mike and I, we don't necessarily agree on everything. <laughs> and, uh, and we have had some vigorous conversations. Harry knows. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I ever used the F-bomb. Um, and she said, and uh, she said, Phil, all of that work is wrong. This is a Mike in comment, right? And I've said this in front of Mike in the audience, so it's not hiding behind it. And she said, it's all mediated by Connexin 43. What? So we had a vigorous conversation. I came back to the lab. I said, okay, let's do the experiment. So we took a Phlox uh, Connexin 43 animal, and we knocked out Connexin 43, and we found that sleep homeostasis was intact. Whew. You can imagine what our, my next conversation was like. But we found something else. So we knocked out uh, connexin 43 in the astrocyte. So here's the uh, Western blot showing reduction in protein expression. Now what we always do, we always hook our animals up to EEG. This is the first assay we do on any manipulation. The most translatable biomarker there is for a mouse. EEGs mean things in people as well as mice. So for example, here's an animal in non-REM sleep, high amplitude, slow wave activity, and no EMG activity. Here they are awake. You look at the, there's no obvious difference. And these animals have been available maybe 15 years, very little phenotype seen. They were always studied in the light phase. When you look in the dark phase, you see a big phenotype. So here, this is non-REM, percent time in non-REM sleep, REM sleep, and wakefulness. And this is in the light phase, and then you see the dark phase. Let's come over to the right-hand side. I'll keep referring us there. So the open symbols are controls. Just before the dark phase, the animals anticipate dark phase is coming. They wake up and they start exploring their environment. But with the Connexin 43 knockout, they start going to sleep. It's a narcolepsy-like phenotype. Here's a hypnogram from individual animals. So here we're scoring every four seconds. Again, that will we. And the animals are going, wake. This is, if you ever have problems waking at night, getting fragmented sleep, feel feel pity for mice. 
they have really fragmented sleep in the light phase. But then in the dark phase, about six hours of oh, beautiful wakefulness, unless you knock out connection 43. And there you see in the dark phase, they're dropping off to sleep. It's not true narcolepsy because they don't immediately go into REM. They're doing brief non-REM into REM. Because it's narcolepsy-like phenotype, we then say, well, we've got to look in the hypothalamus. So in the lateral hypothalamus are, re are rexinergic neurons that are key for wakefulness. And patients with narcolepsy have neurodegeneration of the rexinergic neurons. So Jerome uh, looked here. And if you knocked out connexin 43 in the astrocytes versus controls, there was no change in the rexinergic neurons. But it turns out mechanistically this is really different. And I'm going to tell you the answer, and then we'll look at a little bit of the data. Astrocytes and feet are associated with the vasculature, express GLUT1, take up glucose, and there's a lot of aerobic glycolysis in the astrocyte and can provide lactate. Data I will show you show that this lactate is released from astrocytes by MCT4. It's then taken up into orexinergic neurons by MCT2, converted to pyruvate. And there's a K ATP channel here that when pyruvate declines, this channel opens and orexic neuron, orexinergic neurons become silent. So if you impair this pathway anywhere to reduce pyruvate, this neurons just go hyperpolarize and become inactive. So let's go through some of the, and what happens normally as you're waking up, your rexinergic neurons start firing. So let's go through a couple of experimental questions. So let's knock out connexin 43. Hi, the, based on the hypothesis, we'll get reduced lactate. We're now doing in vivo biosensors, and we actually see reduced lactate. So we should have reduced neuronal activity that will be rescued if we perfuse in lactate. OK, I guess lesson number three. When you study brain slices, you're using glucose at too high a level. Physiological glucose is about two and a half millimolar. We use glucose 10, some, some people even higher. Results are really different when you use glucose at two and a half millimolar. So here everything's in two and a half millimolar glucose. Here's a controlled brain slice recording from an orexinergic neuron. <laughs> These neurons just really beautifully active. If you apply lactate, aquicaloric lactate, so five millimolar, no effect. But if you'd knocked out connexin 43, now what you see is the neurons essentially silent, and that's then rescued by lactate. We've done it in whole cell patch and cell attached patch. So exogenous lactate does rescue the electrical activity in the neuron. We have shown that this torbutamide sensitive potassium channel is involved. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please do. Would you by any chance look at potassium, the level, like basal levels of potassium no. in the extracellular state for those animals? No. That's a good question. Um, one thing uh, that we have done is there's a clear hyperpolarization of the membrane uh, potential, and I don't know whether that could be explained by differences in potassium. Of the, we've already, uh, I have to ask Jerome about the astrocyte. So is pyruvate involved? So what, one way we can test this now in a uh, acutely isolated brain slice is if you just deplete glucose, you know there'll be no glucose, no lactate, go to zero millimolar, the neuron becomes silent. That's rescued by lactate, not shown here, but also by pyruvate. So you add back pyruvate, brrr, if you inhibit the carboxylate transporters, the effect of pyruvate is prevented. Now, is lactate being converted to pyruvate? So we use an uh, enzyme inhibitor, oximate, that prevents lactate being converted to pyruvate. We're in glucose. We inhibit that conversion. The neuron becomes silent. If we add lactate, normally that would rescue. But with this enzyme inhibited, lactate is unable to rescue. But if we now bypass the enzyme with pyruvate, we get full rescue. But is lactate coming from the astrocyte to the neuron? So now we do double patch recordings, record from the orexinergic neuron and the astrocyte, and in the astrocytic pipette, either half at lactate or not. So Jerome did these paired recordings, probably another vacation. Uh, 
And here he depleted glucose, and he's recording with normal whole cell solution in the astrocyte, the erexinergic neuron becomes silent. But when lactate is in the astrocytic patch pipette, the neuron just keeps firing with lactate in the astrocyte. And that effect of lactate in the astrocyte is then prevented by inhibiting monocarboxylate transporters that take this lactate across to the neuron. Now, I'm going to jump to a little bit of data. I use brain, we use brain-wide knockouts. Now we're using viral uh, expression of Cre in the astrocyte in the lateral hypothalamus. Importantly, look in the top right. This is percent wake. You express Cre recombinase in the astrocytes in the lateral hypothalamus. Reduced wakefulness. Really beautiful. And you see here on the hypnograms compared to control. But in vivo, can we rescue with lactate? So now what we do is we do four sequential experiments on each animal. You start off with a period of control, then you express Cre. Now with bilateral cannulae, you introduce vehicle, then you introduce lactate. So let's again look in the top right here. And I think the white, the white symbols are control. Then one of the black symbols is we've expressed Cre recombinase in the astrocytes. Now less wakefulness. Then we infuse vehicle, still less wakefulness. But then when we deliver 5 millimolar lactate, we rescue normal wakefulness in these animals. So very, uh, in my remaining six minutes, a couple of very new experiments are ongoing. So the, what's happening here then, glucose is converted to lactate in the astrocyte. It's transported into the neuron and converted to pyruvate. If there's not enough pyruvate, this potassium channel opens, the cell becomes silent. Now, we've done pharmacological inhibition in brain slices. It's possible that there's no monocarboxylate transporter mediating efflux from the astrocyte. It could be a connexin hemichannel. So we've now collaborated with Luke Pellerin, and we have FLOX MCT1, MCT2, and MCT4 mice, and we're doing erexinergic-specific knockout of the transporters and astrocyte-specific knockouts. So here's, take you through a few experiments. This is the idea. So we have connexin 43 between astrocytes. We have GLUT3. Glucose is taken up. I didn't make this. I don't have the patience. And some of it's stored in uh, glycogen. And then uh, lactate's produced by the astrocyte. And the idea is the lactate now passes through the astrocytic network across via, hopefully, monocarboxylate transporters. And it then transports across into the neuron. So let's test these steps. Is glycogenolysis required? And so the way we're doing this now, all in vivo assays. So there's an inhibitor of glycogenolysis called DAB. And you now know how to interpret these slides. Here's the dark phase, ZT12 to 18. So control, ACSS, DAB that inhibits glycogenolysis. Then in the final one, DAB plus lactate rescues. And we're surprised, actually, by how large an effect of inhibiting glycogenolysis is. Are monocarboxylate transporters involved in vivo? So we do the same type of experiment. Control, vehicle, um, monocarboxylate transport inhibitor promotes sleepiness. Now we'll take our monocarbox flux monocarboxylate transporter 1, 2, and 4. And we either do brain-wide knockouts, where we use a glass Cree uh, ART, or we use a pre-pro-erexin Cree for neuronal erexin knockouts. Now, normally MCT2 is expressed in neurons, and 1 and 4 probably in astrocytes. And our data now show a conclusively in astrocytes. So with our MCT1 and 4 mice, we can also knock out with retroorbital injection of um, this PHP-EB virus which then we get beautiful brain-wide expression. <clears throat> so we do, we do that approach. We do targeted injection of viruses, brain-wide knuckles. All of the data are in agreement. So let's see what we've got first. So this is Alicia Braga. So here, between ZT12 and 18, I've got to read the title. Oh, yeah. This is, um, sorry, this is uh, the erexinergic neuron knocking out MCT2. And what you see is significant reduction in wakefulness. 
So MCT2 in the, in the neurons is important. You then cut out the brain slices. If you've knocked out MCT2, the neurons are silent. This is in glucose. If you add a lactate, you don't rescue because, of course, there's no transporter. What's this one? So, and it looks like MCT4, but not MCT1, is important in an astrocyte. So here we do, this is direct injection into the lateral hypothalamus to express CRE in astrocytes there. And this takes three months for the phenotype to emerge. And I can tell you why I think that's important later, but we see the phenotype. And we're just doing the rescue experiments. Now, the amazing thing about this phenotype, we detected it because of narcolepsy. But you might expect that this mechanism of shuttling lactate could occur elsewhere in the brain. And we actually have known for about two years that's probably true. Because when you look, although sleep homeostasis is intact, if you look at non-REM sleep, and the low frequency component of slow wave activity, is the power is less. So we said maybe cortical pyramidal neurons are less excitable. And this is, uh, I'm sorry the traces don't come through well, but here's a change in resting potential when this is knocking out connection 43. And here's a normal input-output curve, which is then the effect of knocking out. So this is happening elsewhere in the brain. We've done a bunch of pharmacology. I'm not going to show it to you. It's all agreeing with the same pathway. But we picked out narcolepsy because those neurons are normally tonically. They're going gangbusters. And so we had a very sensitive assay. So this comes to this, the, the notion of the summary. What we believe is occurring, uh, and of course subject to more data, is glucose is taken up by the astrocyte, shuttle, uh, converted to lactate, and then it's shuttled from uh, MCT4 into the extracellular space, taken up by MCT2, converted to lactate to enter oxidative phosphorylation. If lactate levels decline, what happens is the cells become less excitable. Okay, I now got to introduce epilepsy. I'm not going to show epilepsy data. I'm going to talk about our work on others. This is so cool. You get less excitable neurons. Hmm. Now, what happens in the ketogenic diet? Many things. But in the ketogenic diet, when you don't have glucose, you are bypassing pyruvate. And so the neurons have their potassium channels open and they will be hyperpolarized and less excitable. Is that a contributor to the ketogenic diet? Well, there's a paper in 2015 in Science by Seda et al. which support this notion. Now, I've got to look at my notes, because I'm really bad at remembering names. Oh, I, I can't see them. But there's an anticonvulsant that begins with S. Uh, someone in the audience is going to know it. It's the right anticonvulsant. What's well, been discovered, an off-target effect of the anticonvulsant is to inhibit LDH1 and reduce lactate conversion to pyruvate. When you add this anticonvulsant, then the neurons become less excitable, and you can rescue it by putting pyruvate. So it's really intriguing that this pathway has the potential um, to, to be utilized as anticonvulsants. So we're now playing games, as you can imagine, in epilepsy models, perturbing this metabolic pathway to see these effects. I got a summary slide, then I'm going to take you through something dear to my heart in one minute. So these are the people who've done the work. I told you about Tomah, Jackie, and Michaela. Um, Alicia and Martina have been performing the more recent work. And then the people who did the original key, key stuff. Collaborations with Don Kong, Steve Moss, and Jesse Tesco, and Luke Pellerin. Let me, I just want to now, my next five years, I have epilepsy. I've been medically controlled for 40 years, and my goal is to inspire people with epilepsy to do more. I just set up a uh, 501c3 charity called Sail for Epilepsy, and our goal is I'm going to navigate the ocean, circumnavigate the globe, try and inspire people with epilepsy, and raise funds for researching epilepsy, um, and go to sailforepilepsy.org. Here's my current race boat. Navigate, inspire. I was just waking up in an offshore uh, race, cure, 
and educate. This is a navigation system on the boat. And we've partnered with the Epilepsy Foundation of New England. We have summer camps where people with epilepsy can come and learn to sail. I'm going to be navigating, come to the website, social media, so on and so forth. And uh, follow us as we're going around the globe. And just as we ask, answer questions. I hope no one gets seasick. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Oh, go for it, yeah. Why not studying the appetite? Obviously, the orexin neurons are regulating I'll show appetite. you the data afterwards. Because so there's a lot of people that are interested are, in reducing appetite. There are <laughs> dramatic impacts on insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance. Mm hmm uh, ATP, yeah. How do I think what? How are they sensing differently? Well, first, there, there is likely that the ATP are in large vesicles, and they may well be more localized to the cell body, whereas, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment, whereas the deserine vesicles are small electron lucent vesicles right out in the fine processes. So they're going to have different machinery associated with them. And you ask, how could ATP released at a cell body have an impact on a synapse? Well, the great thing about ATP is once it's hydrolyzed to adenosine, it's just diffusive transporters, essentially. And it's just this general change in uh, ambient adenosine tone. Unlike glutamate, where you have high affinity rapid uptake. It's a very s slow uptake. And the, the, dr the main driver of converting adenosine back to AMP is actually adenosine kinase, as it's taken in through equilibrative transporters back into the cell. What are the different sensors? I don't know. I've had so many arrows in my back about sensors of calcium, I decided I'm going to leave that for the younger crew. So DCRIN is in the extracellular space, but it's very confined. So there, and the idea, and this is work uh, Thomas did in, with Stephen Ollier, is that at the synapse, DCRIN is really localized in the synaptic cleft for those NMDA receptors. And there's some transport process that prevents DCRIN going down to those really extrasynaptic locations. But there, there's glycine. And so it's like the glycine really at these extra synaptic lo locations, but deserine is really regulated in the synaptic cleft through some tramp. Oh, yeah, we have, yeah. So there's multiple sources of deserine, and all we're showing here is this 20% that's wakefulness dependent is coming from this astrocytic source. There's also evidence for neuronal sources of deserine. And so the 80% is other compartments. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great idea. We've really not, but um, we, I think it's time for us to develop the list and start going through and seeing which receptors, you know, couple to, couple to what. Where one thing we're really interested in now is norepinephrine, because norepinephrine is known to regulate glycogenolysis. And so whether, as the animals wake up, whether norepinephrine is actually stimulating glycogenolysis and the flux of lactate to support this uh, wakefulness effect. We have a little bit of data, and you know, the first N is always the best one. <laughs> the error bars are so tight. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if I if I am interpreting your slides correctly or what you showed us, you were doing the retroorbital injections to knock out the neuronal uh, uh, trans the MC, <clears throat> MCT 
NCG transporter, and you were showing us that these neurons were hypothalamized. Mm -hmm. So with the global um, yes. delivery like that. No, let me interrupt you. So for the neuronal knockout, we're using a pre pro orexin oh, okay. promoter. So it's very specifically okay. orexin nergic neurons express Cree. Yeah. The retroorbital was when we did like a brain wide Cree and astrocytes. And then we follow it with local uh, viral delivery into the lateral hypothalamus. So how does uh, global level of the Yeah, this, so this is an interesting question about, are the orexinergic neurons sensing glucose? And depends who you speak to. Um, there's one idea is there's a glucose sensing ability of the orexinergic neuron independent of glucose in met meta metabolism. Uh, there are several groups have not been able to repeat that, that data. Now, when you have high glucose in a brain slice, neurons do express glucose transporters and they can take up glucose and utilize it without question. Uh, but the, the question becomes, how much of the normal energetic demands of the neuron are mediated by glucose as opposed to lactate coming in? And, are in, and really, you can only answer that question in vivo, because even though I say two and a half millimolar is physiological, you're, you, well, the evidence we have from other works was about two and a half millimolar, but even at five millimolar, you're still okay. Um, so, all of the studies we're now doing in vivo, can we rescue effects with lactate? Can we rescue them with glucose? And it's about titrating. So one thing we're really kind of excited about is if you think in vivo, if you knock out MCT2, the transports in neurons, which transports lactate, not glucose, you get the phenotype. Yeah. Well, there are no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.